Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Energy Speaks Back, powered by Hark. My name is Paul Webb. I'm the founder of B2B Energy, and I'm also your host. Weekly, I present to you experts from around the world, and today we're in the UK. Our purpose, as always, is to provide a good understanding of energy management knowledge from around the world, which is available today for us to deliver energy savings that impact on our planet. So before we get started into our exciting interview about the energy crisis today, I would like to recognize our sponsors. So they are Clean Energy Revolution, who provide knowledge and networking around the world, B2B Energy for their energy management and managing organization's third largest expense, Park Systems, who are renowned for their energy software, EcoSync for their heating solutions around radiator control, Alexis Energy for their power management, Lead Vision, who are an LED and a control specialist, Sign Watts, who are an electronics and EV transition organization, and Black Carbon, who are a waste to energy organization. And lastly, our certificate partners, who are Esther Energy. So welcome to episode 55 of Energy Speaks Back. My special guest today is an energy expert in the field of pricing. I'm really excited about this episode because we're really going to dig into the real facts behind this current energy crisis. And our expert today has come from delivering coal to power stations to actually trading energy for major energy users. So without any further ado, I give you David Loveday. Good afternoon, Dave, and how are you today? Ah, fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Yep. Uh, happy yeah. that it's Friday. We've seen a, uh, a very interesting uh, energy market this week, and uh, we've had lots of uh, inquiries from the people, our customers that we deal with. So it's nice to now be getting to that point in the day where you can start to kick back a little bit and start to enjoy enjoy the weekend. You know, the weekend kind of starts here. And it's half past five and you're in the UK. And yes, it's it's that Friday feeling, isn't it? Because tomorrow's Saturday. Um, I won't say my favourite saying, which is I always call it Poets Day. I don't know if you, you use Poets Day, do you? Yep, yep. I completely understand what you mean when you say Poets Day. <laughs> Yeah, a typical I've, English I've thing. Maybe, maybe I'll do a, a, a translation for people who want to contact me direct. So, Dave, yeah. um, we've met, I think we met this time last year. and We've had a, a, a meeting on Zoom and we talked about the industry together. You reached out to me. You commented um, on quite a few of my posts over the, the, the sort of... Uh, last year etc so i know a lot about you and what you do and etc but for the benefit of our audience today could you give us some background to dave love day your sort of where you've come from your origin story and and what you're doing today yeah yeah my my, my story into energy is probably quite unusual um if i go back way back in my career i've been in the energy industry about 20 years but if i go right back to the start the way i got into in- energy was to deliver coal as a train driver into a coal-fired power stations of Yorkshire. So Drax and Egborough power station, for anybody who knows the coal, the, air fire, uh, wow. the Airedale power stations. Um, sat around on one dismal evening waiting to be unloaded. I was looking at the power station. I thought, mm, that looks interesting. I wonder what goes on that actually goes on inside there. Love it. So I, mo- I moved into the power station as a plant operative. So outside on the... On the um, the machinery out there, the boilers, the mills that grind the coal up, all the pumps, the the generator, um, cut my teeth on on those, and then I moved from Egbra to Drax Power Station uh, into the operations, into the control room. So I was an assistant unit controller on the 645 megawatt generating generation set. Um, That's amazing. Fast so would you working? Little. Would you have been working for the CEGB then? No, I, w- I was post CGB. So I came in when the industry had been privatized. I joined um, National Power when National right. Power had its own rail arm. So National Power um, decided to buy six locomotives uh, and I had a rake of wagons. It already o- had a bit of experience of the open track um, licensing for the rail network in bringing gypsum to Drax Power Station for the um, blue 
gas desulfurization plant there and then decided that he wanted to buy some more wagons to move coal to its power stations and that's when i became involved so we're talking about 1995 here right when i when i started in the energy the energy space 2001 saw me at Drax for when we had Neat go live, so the new electricity trading arrangement. Yep. And that's when I moved into trading. Um, and from there, really, uh, my career has been either as a category manager or an energy manager, or I've been working in the consultancy space. Um, and that's where it finds me at this moment in time. I work for a third party intermediary in the consultancy space, managing energy procurement validation on behalf of large uh, retail and industrial consumers. So I've, I've, I've been across the whole gambit, really, from from generation, actually seeing the electricity generated um, through to, um, you know, managing people's consumption and, and utilisation of it. And along the way, I've also experienced the start of the renewables obligation, the, re, the start of the uh, European emissions trading scheme. Uh, and you know, most recently, we've also got now got the UK trading scheme, which is kind of interesting, really, when you think even before there was a European emissions trading scheme, there was a UK trading scheme. We kind of have, have invented the concept, then yeah. were kicked out because of Brexit, and now we're, and now we're, and now we've got our own scheme once again um, that we're looking to once once more at some point in the future, I dare say, integrate back into the European emissions trading scheme to have that larger pool. Of emissions to be able to trade with because ours is a, a very small and niche scheme at the moment given it's just uk and, U, and uk industry that's caught by it and when you talk about the the trading and and the the energy work you've been doing is that been for major energy users or the sme sectors Uh, it's predominantly uh, what we call what you know as INC clients, so large right. industrial and commercial clients, and not not the smaller end of the market. So yeah. we have uh, some large fac facility management companies in there. We have some large manufacturing companies in there. Um, so there are some quite heavy uh, energy users in there that we've been managing their positions for, and so, and and we've you know it it's it it really has become more to the forefront of people's minds now with what we've seen in this, you know, the last 12 months of energy prices sort of like increasing by 200%. It kind of focuses people's mind on this cost because it's such a high cost now in, in terms of their overall cost base. Yeah. So you've brought us straight into where I wanted to, to talk about, which is the, I, I call it the energy crisis um, and predominantly you know, your focus has been the UK and we have got global listeners. So I'd, I'd like to touch on some of the global stuff if you can, but let's talk about the, the UK and offline. You was sort of, um, you was telling me about um, how you, you since this was coming many, many months before since, since the start of the new year. So can you sort of give us some, some background to that of what's been happening in the market? Yeah. So, um, the first indications of this, as we, as we were discussing offline, Paul, I think were around Christmas time when we started to see prices rising. And that cut kind of fed into the fact that we're also starting to see the benign, what had been a benign uh, carbon price starting to rise as we moved from phase three of the European emissions trading scheme into phase four, which had much tighter caps on it. So part of that could have been, you know, you could have said that that was part of the response to the tightening of the caps and the movement of carbon in drives the movement of both um, electricity and, and, and gas prices because of the, the relative carbon content of gas and coal generation. Yeah. And, and as we went through the winter, uh, sort of like December coming into January, the market was rising. Not, not so much that it would set alarm bells ringing, but it was, you know, the market was moving up. So we were looking at clients' positions and people that were what, were, what we considered lowly hedged we were starting to look at increasing those hedges just in case. You know, at this point, we were still like, well, February could start to see the normal sell-off, and then we've still got some volume open to be able to pick up on that. And indeed, when we moved into February, we did actually see that sell-off. But that was quickly countered, you know, within a few days. And then from kind of like the March time, the traffic has been pretty much one way. Occasional pauses, but it's been going up. 
and the, and the reasons behind that are, 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 are many fold. I mean, a number of them are weather de uh, weather derived. We had a, a peer a cold extended cold period, not not yeah. like the beast from the east cold, but it yeah. was cold enough that people would want to keep their heat in on to keep their houses warm, which depleted gas the amount of gas that we had in storage. So we got to a point in April where normally we'd have been injecting gas, we were still withdrawing gas, so that overall storage level was going down, yeah. which meant that we then had a bigger a bigger amount to recover through the summer period to get ourselves into a good position for this winter. Then you couple into that the COVID period that we'd just gone through where nobody could go out to do anything, and that included doing maintenance on, on, on gas infrastructure. So what we did see as well was a significant amount of maintenance taking place both on UK gas infrastructure but also on Norwegian gas plant as well so we've seen kind of unprecedented levels of maintenance on Norwegian gas levels um, again a bit been a bit more UK centric nuclear power plant about 50 percent of the available about 50 percent of the nuclear fleet in the UK was offline for various checks and maintenance yeah yeah so, 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 and and then, of course, the, the final part of the puzzle was, of course, the UK has about what nineteen gigawatts of installed wind capacity, which is fantastic when the wind blows. Doesn't do when very much wind. for you when it isn't. No. So the, all these factors kind of came together, which meant that even though we we need the energy, we need the electricity, we would already de would deplete in our gas storage, but we needed gas fired generation to be on the bars. To make the shortfall from the renewables and the nuclear plant not being available, yeah, and and, and this is we also what and added to that wasn't there a reduced capacity for the storage as well? Haven't we shut down one of our storage areas um, because of lack of funding from the government? The the rough rough storage, which was the large yeah. largest storage facility under the North Sea, um, has been shut down for a while because it needed some extensive remedial as i understand it it needed some extensive remedial work undertaking on it and the differential price between summer and winter to buy gas in summer inject it and then it, uh withdraw it in winter that differential wasn't there because we were getting a lot of lng cargoes coming in from around the globe so the so the the, the, the funding to be able to do this maintenance work wasn't there so centrica the owners of rough storage decided to shut it down at that point yeah. So we lost our largest storage facility. Not to say in the UK we don't have storage facilities, but they're all medium term, short term, churn in a month kind of storage facility. Yeah. So so what would have naturally been a buffer to spikes in prices isn't there. But I mean, going through this scenario that we've gone through, it's difficult to see when we would actually be injecting because the price of gas has just been going up and up all the time. There isn't been that kind of, yeah, summer's cheap buy now, store for winter, when winter will be more expensive. It's been that continual flow of prices upwards, you know, until we've got into the start of winter this year, which, you know, October's been been very good to us. We haven't had a cold snap yet, touch wood. And, you know, it's been relatively mild, relatively wet but and windy. So that's taken a bit of pressure off the start of winter. But let's see how winter plays out. Is it lulling us into a yeah. false sense of security at this moment yeah. in time? So that's really what we've seen. But also on, on a global scale, we've seen, you know, LNG tankers that may have come to the UK going to the Far East because they had a cold winter like the UK had a cold winter. They depleted their storage. We saw extremely high prices in China, Japan for the January period. And clearly they didn't want to get caught again going into this winter. So they have been buying, you know, gas, um, like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. We've also had Latin America suffering from drought. So their hydropower has been down. So a lot of American cargoes that may have transited the Atlantic have been going into Latin America. So there, so you've seen, and you've also seen gas cargoes from America transiting through the Panama Canal to get to the Asian markets. So we've lost the hot flow. We've lost the Qatari, the, the African flow, because that's been going to the Asian markets. But I'm not saying we've not had any LNG cargoes, but it's been a constant battle through the summer to attract those cargoes. We've been, we increased our gas price, China increased their gas price. We increased our gas price, China increased their. You know, it's been laddering up all the way through summer 
yeah. trying to get these limited flows of cargoes coming to either the you know the northwest European hub or the or the Asian market, um, and then and then obviously feeding into China's demand for gas has been the fact that they had a, a kind of moratorium on indigenous coal, um, being able to, to to mine indigenous coal because of safety concerns around the mine. So the Chinese government kind of limited what they could have in terms of indigenous coal. So if you don't have one fuel source, you've got to replace it with another one, which is yeah. gas. And, and again, you know, if I keep thinking about this and all the drivers in this, the globe is ru rushing to decarbonize energy and the transitional fuel from that to move away from what what would be classed as highly polluting coal to renewables is gas because it's got half the carbon content of coal. So like the UK uses gas as it's transitioning and Europe will use gas as it's transitioning. So is, so is everybody else. Yeah. So the demand of gas has gone up or the demand for gas has gone up as well. Uh, and then uh, uh, on if we think so if that's on the generation side if we think on the demand side of course we've seen the global recovery out of a, a pandemic start so what you've really seen here is um, demand just outstripping supply because of all the maintenance that's been taken on 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 the supply side and 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 the demand side has recovered a lot faster than the supply side can catch up with because you've had a lot of new plants where the financial decision final financial decision hasn't been made because prices during the COVID period were so low, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Now you're seeing these prices rise. It does make sense, but there's a lag. So demand will, you know, we've seen what demand has done. But it'll take a while for supply to be able to catch up with that, just because some of the decisions that you maybe needed to be made a year ago, two years ago, have been postponed. So you'll you'll have that delay in in, in supply being able to catch up. And then we had another issue regarding the interconnection, didn't we? From, from yeah, the inter yeah, the interconnector between uh, the UK and France. Unfortunately, one of the it the, there's two two in the simplest terms two wires there, and unfortunately, there's been an incident on one of the wires, which means that that has gone down from two gig down to one gig now, uh, and and looks like it's likely to be so until late part of 22 maybe 23 i'm thinking wow i thought that no, was going to be a, a, like a couple maybe of months 20. out so it's going it's going to no, be out for it's going to be out period. for a while I'd, 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 I'd need to have a look at how long the the one that was involved in the fire is going to be out for but it's not a quick return on that one the the other pole which was on maintenance is coming back and should be back on within the next couple of weeks i think right so it's, we had one of them down on maintenance and one caught fire Yes. Hence, we had none. Right. Yeah, for that one. So that's for. Oh, so that. So what I heard then is that the getting it back online was the obviously the maintenance one that was coming back online within the month. Right. Yeah. That's that, 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 that's that's the way I understand it. Um, so we have heard um, from the government saying that you know these times are here to stay for a significantly long period of time. Are we likely to ever see this turn around again and go back to the norm regarding energy, or are we we going to have to live with all this for a long period of time now? Uh, if, if, if you're looking at the the, the forward well, the forward curves in the energy market, you're probably looking at elevated prices out until summer twenty three, winter twenty three. Um, a lot hinges on how we get through this winter. A lot of hinges on our our friends in in Russia and what they're able to supply extra in terms of gas into into Europe, and and I suppose you know that that's what's been interesting this week is, is is the sounds that are coming out of Russia and with Putin telling Gazprom they need to get their internal storage filled by I believe the eighth of November, and then the the European market looking at well once that's done is there going to be additional flows into Europe. And we have seen the market sell off over the last couple of days based on an expectation that potentially there is going to be some more gas. So it's so it's looking slightly more positive at the moment. Mm. But there's there's nothing definite there. And there's you know, the the fundamental underlying low gas in storage and we're still got to go through winter yet, does mean that this market could bounce. This could be a 
a small lull before the market ticks back up again. Equally, if the gas does flow from from Russia and it does take that bit of pressure off and it does add that bit of resilience to the market, then some of that risk premia that we're seeing and have been seeing is likely to come out of this market. But, you know, we've got we've still got high carbon prices and you know, that is the European and the UK government's will to decarbonize, to incentivize renewable energy. So we're not going to see a carbon price that's going to suddenly collapse back down to 20 euros a ton, hmm. you know, where it's currently up at, I think, 58 was the last I saw today. So that, that, that that's still going to feed into your electricity prices. So your electricity prices aren't going to fall all the way back, even if, you know, we see a, a slight sell off in gas. Uh, and gas and coal, which we which, which which we are seeing at the moment. So, I do believe that we're going to see elevated prices for a period of time. We're not going to see the, you know, the the four pound a therm or the two pound a therm that we're currently seeing, but it, it will be higher. That you know, I, I remember looking at this with a colleague earlier this year, and we saw winter twenty one coming up to seventy pence a therm for the gas. Well, and we thought that's looking quite expensive you know this might be an opportunity to unlock some volume yeah and then and then we watched it and we didn't do anything and we just watched it and now you know you're, you're looking at like the two pound of firm and boy wasn't that a good decision not to unlock anything at that point now with it with yeah. the benefit of answer but yeah. you can just see how this market has moved and how different the current market that we're in has been from you know like the five we, we've got a few charts where we've got like the, the five year average and this market is significantly above there you know some of some some of the prices you're probably in, in terms of power you're probably high 40s low 50s you know and you look at what we're paying now for for, for, for the summer contract over a hundred pound a megawatt hour for it you know double what what the long run run average would be for these contracts. When you when you talk about megawatt, how does that translate down to the, the to the kilowatt hour? What's the what's the um, the prices of that regarding? Because I, I have heard some really crazy figures for for gas and electricity. Well, I've heard thirty two yeah. pence. So, so, for... so, yeah, so 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 what you're looking at there, you know, if you're talking a hundred pound a megawatt hour, you're talking ten pence a kilowatt hour. And that's the energy only part of it. And, yeah, if you energy, think about energy, and then you've got another, what, another, and it's at roughly 40, 60 nowadays regarding. Yeah. The, the, right. Yeah. So you've got that other 60% to add on top of that, which is all your transmission charges and all your renewable levies. Yeah. Your non et cetera, et cetera. So, so, yeah. so I think we were, we, we were still seeing prices for uh, Q1 electricity. So, you know, January to March 2022 electricity up about the 36 pence a kilowatt hour mark all in so you know these are these are high prices when you think that we, we used to be you know low 20s in yeah. in terms of pence per kilowatt hour even even lower than that really probably 18 was uh, a and that's tasty a significant price. change I, I i've got a contract i'm working with a, an organization at the moment and 14p uh i remember when we started in 2016 we was doing their energy uh, sort of profiling and you know it was 12 pence we was using and then then we was using 14 pence and now to now start to look at say 30 plus pence that's going to be an amazing it's double their cost yeah. that makes a big impact on their business doesn't it it does absolutely you know we we we, we, feel, we feel for our clients through through this period just because of how much that that, that energy cost has increased and you know we, we we've started to see in the in 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 the energy market as well that these prices are for some for some companies unsustainable and we've started to see some sort sort of demand destruction on 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 in terms of what they're trying to do in terms of consumption trying to turn down maybe postponing things maybe pulling back production just because the the cost is is, is too high and that affects everyone doesn't it I, even so I've moved from a three bedroom house to a two bedroom apartment and I was shocked to know that my energy price thinking of oh, downsized, my energy price is going to be less now. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> it's no. exactly the same. No difference. No, so you, you ju you're just offsetting the amount you consume by a higher price, aren't you? Yeah. So that, 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 yeah. That, that's, that's literally it. it. You know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a, it's a difficult time. I think we've also seen that in the market, haven't we, with the exiting of a number of smaller suppliers as well. 
yeah. Where, where those the, have... So that when these supplies go, obviously they've gone because they've hedged incorrectly, or they 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 it's caught them out as well, hasn't it? It's caught the suppliers out because they were they were committed to sell energy at that price. Has that also impacted on the energy prices as well? These energy supplies going because it must be a, like a a very nervous um, system now, mustn't it? It, it has it hasn't too much um it may it probably will do in the future in in terms of you know competition um uh, but in terms of, of the energy supplies that have gone into administration I, I don't think it's because they were particularly badly run companies undoubtedly there may be a few that are it it will be around their ability to hedge the, the, the you know the amount of money that you need to be able to put up as 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 a credit line to hedge in these high price markets, um, it's what you've locked your customers into versus what the current market is. And if you haven't back to back, you know, taking on board a customer and then locking it in, the differential here will and and the mark to market value will be quite large. And then of course on top of that, any late customers that you've brought on. You've got the price cap. You can't charge a, a domestic customer more than the price cap. So even though the energy market is significantly above that, you're happening to wear this cost. And some, unfortunately, some companies, and we're seeing, starting to see, you know, if if the the news is to be believed, some of the slightly larger companies now struggling with this as well. Yeah. So the casualties and, we've and seen. I think what you... Sorry. Sorry, one day. I was just going to say, you know, in in terms of what, what what we've seen, we've seen, you know, some of the some of the very large companies struggling, but then you get into the supplier of last resort, and of course they're taking clients on a, a, a what is effectively a loss to them because of the the energy cap. Mm. So that cost has got to be picked up by somebody at some point, and you know, these are, these are businesses; they're not charities. So eventually, yeah. this will this will filter back through into people's bills. I dare say. Yeah. So we've seen some casualties already and we're likely to see more casualties long term because of this. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've seen the end of, of, of the companies that are going to struggle for this through this. It may slow down. Now, now the energy price has turned slightly. It may slow down. You know, all we can do and I think what the energy industry as a whole is hoping for is a is a, a, a return to normality in terms of prices as i say and as we've discussed it's not going to be a short-term no. event you know I, I, I this we're going to see but as i say i think we've got at least another year if not 18 months of elevated prices before we start to see anything back towards you know what we would consider normal although it's it's amazing how People have kind of adapted to the current market. These are high prices, but when the market moves, you know, five pound a megawatt hour or ten pound a megawatt hour in a day, but it's still above two hundred pound a megawatt hour for you know for periods, or above a hundred megawatt hundred pound a megawatt hour for the summer. How accepting people are now in the market that it's a hundred pound a megawatt hour when you know fifty pound was the norm before. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, just how it's rebased itself based on these high prices. It becomes a new normal, as they say. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it. You know, people don't yeah. bat an eye. You know, as I, I, I dropped into, I think it was probably a LinkedIn post. I kind of said, you know, we used to think 70 pence a therm for winter was expensive. We, we, could, we could stomach a pound plus a therm for a particular event, the compressor fire at Ruff. The tsunami uh, in Japan taking all the LNG over there. Short-term events, price spikes, we could accept that. We did never expected that we'd have a prolonged rally in the market that would just see these prices been the everyday price. It was like, yeah, yeah, up for a couple of weeks and then back off again because the market corrected. It was a bit of panic buying because who's going to have the supply? Then when the, there was a plenty to go around, it was like, oh, right, everybody breathes a sigh of relief, prices come back down. Yeah. This time we haven't seen that. We've just seen this protracted bull run to, to the prices where we are. And as I say, it's only over the last three or four days that we've actually seen this market look like it might come off. And that, again, has been driven by, by you know, 
the noises around Nord Stream 2 and, 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 and the Russians potentially sending some more gas into Europe, which is yet to, to be seen. I mean, if, 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 if you were critical, you could say, well, there is additional capacity on the existing pipelines without Nord Stream 2 that could be filled to send more gas if, if, if the willingness to do so was there. So it's, yeah. it's, all, it's, all, it's all very interesting. For me, though, um, like having to have to be reliant on, you know, well, I don't want to start a war now. <laughs> no, you no. Just think of it Energy Speaks Back starts a war by saying, you uh, know, we're going to be held to the Russians regarding the gas, you know, to ransom. Yeah. We could be, couldn't we? Yeah, I think it, I think it's a a, a a bit. It would be a bit harsh to say that we've been held to ransom by it. And and you know, if you if you if you if you want the political conspiracy that this is all about Nord Stream two, nothing else, you know. Yeah, yeah. That that that's what you could look at. Um, equally, you could say you know the the Americans were quite quite keen to wean Europe off Russian gas, and were sending a lot of shell gas cargoes across the Atlantic until there were more attractive markets, and then all of a sudden those cargoes aren't there. So I think I think what Russia has this time, and which it has probably hasn't had to this extent before, it's the only game in town. Whereas right. before it didn't have that um, that power because there was always LNG, there was always other sources of, you know, you'd either had the indigenous gas from the UK continental shelf, we had the pipe gas from Europe coming in. I mean, the, the other part that we haven't spoken about, of course. Is the Netherlands in the Groningen gas field, the large Groningen gas field in the Netherlands, which unfortunately has been shut down because of the earthquakes it was causing right. when, when they were extracting the gas. So, you know, there's been a number of so other sources of gas that have been removed. But what, but because the American flows are going to Latin America and the and the Far East, and because a number of the other you know flows from Africa and Kuwait are going to the Far East. We've seen a dearth of LNG cargoes come into Europe, so that leaves the only game in town really been what the Russians can pipe across. So they do have a slightly transient market dominant position at the moment. But if 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 everything returns to normal and you know um, the amount of LNG from facilities picks up and Australia is able to start pumping more LNG into the Asian market, which may displace some of the Middle East cargoes from Kuwait come in and, and start that coming back to Europe. If the situation improves in Latin America so they can move back to more generation from hydro and reduce their requirements for LNG. So we see all these cargoes starting to come back to the northwest. And of course, that power that Russia currently has diminishes. And, yeah. you know, maintenance next year on, on, the, on the Norwegian gas infrastructure is lower than this year. So we'll have, you know, more flows um, from 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 Norway, and then the weather might play a blinder. We might not have a cold winter. We might have a mild winter, which means that okay, we've only got seventy-seven percent of gas uh, gas storage full at the moment versus ninety that we want. But we might come out with fifty percent still in there, and then it's a whole new ball game when we move into the yeah. into the next year. You know, there's, what there's an so amazing many variables. market. What is an amazing marketplace? You 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 you've become an economic person about the economics, and now you're talking about being a weatherman as well, Dave. <laughs> that, that's what you need to be, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. You need to wear many many hats in 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 in, in trade in energy. You know, it's certainly with you know the interconnection between the markets, the fact that a lot of gas is now LNG on on ships that can go wherever there's the infrastructure to unload them. You know, it's not uncommon now to see ships turn around mid-voyage because another market is now trading at a premium to the one it was originally yeah. going to be delivering to. Yeah. So we have. Well, I used cargo. to live along. I used to live along the Thames, and we could see the gas boats sitting out in the estuary there, waiting to come in. But they wouldn't come in because as soon as they came in, that is the price of the gas. Well, they're waiting yeah. for the gas prices to go up before they came in, so they yeah. sit out there. We, I used to sit there all the time and ask the question, why are those tankers sitting out there? You know, and that's because <laughs> well, it, it was the, the price wasn't right, the premium prices weren't right for them. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not like a pipeline where it's there, it's fixed. The flow from A to B is, you know, yes, you don't need to flow gas, but that's the only place that you can deliver it. 
when it's on board a boat, it can go anywhere that's got the unloading facilities for it. So yeah. you're, so, so the world really is your oyster in terms of being an energy trader on with a cargo of gas and looking at all the various different markets where to where to deliver it to. And did we have the problems with the um, with the boat that got stuck on in the canal? Was, did that? Oh yeah, the Suez Canal. Well? With the evergreen, I think it was evergreen. One to the, the the container vessel that got lodged across yeah. the Suez Canal. Yeah. So we saw LNG that would have come up from Qatar, been trapped behind that. Um, so that left with a, a number of vessels out of position, kind of thing, and journey times taking longer because they had the choice then whether they were going to go go around the the, the Horn of Africa yeah. to come to the European markets or or wait it out. So there's been some absolutely amazing issues that have all accumulated around the price, isn't there? You know, if you think back. You know, you've just rattled off about 10 or 20 different things here that have all contributed to this uh, crisis, global crisis. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the, but the, there have been a number of things that have all led, led into this this high energy price. And they have just seemed to build, as we've gone through the year, they just seem to build on each other. I remember hearing about the, uh, the, the container ship across the Suez and thinking, that isn't going to be good for prices, you know. Yeah. Just, just because of the impact on on the LNG flows, but you know, it's just been one of those years where it's been like the catch up year from COVID. So 2020, nothing could be repaired, nothing could be done. Yes, we weren't using as much because we we're all in lockdown and sitting at home, and industry was was pared back. But then, of course, when the brakes came off, everything was like, oh, you know, everything wanted the energy, but everything was still in maintenance mode to catch up. And that's what we've seen. It's just been perfect. It's it's perfect economics, isn't it? Price, uh, supply and demand. Yeah. And price is set by supply and demand and getting that back into equilibrium. Yeah. Well, the the, the demand's been there, but the supply's been cl- slow to catch up. So we've just seen that price. So the interesting point, away. you come on this podcast today and you was telling me how, you know, you're really pleased that it's now Friday evening. You can kick off your shoes, put your feet up and start relaxing. You can't start relaxing because you've still got that mark. This market doesn't turn off, does it? It doesn't stop for Friday night, does it? You're going to be constantly thinking about it and researching or things are going to be coming up all over the weekend. Yeah. I mean, more, more, you know, yeah, the, 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 the the energy market, you know, the European and UK energy market goes to bed on a Friday night and, and wakes up fresh on a, on a Monday to see, you know what? What's but it, it it looks at what's been happening over the weekend in the oil yeah. market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Other 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 markets that feed into the energy market. So, yeah, I'm 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 always looking at like the oil price and things like that just to see if I can get some steer. Because if you remember, in the early days, oil and gas used to have a very tight correlation. Not exactly, so much yeah. now. They t- tend to trade off their own markets. But if the oil price went up, you knew the gas price was going to go. And I think that is still true to some extent. If the gas market hasn't got anything else to drive it, it's just like it remembers its old friend oil. And if oil's gone up, then gas will go up if there's nothing else. What was the reason to bring that more in line? Was it because we were using the gas to generate electricity? What? Because it used to basically follow each other. The oil used to go up, then the gas, then electricity, didn't it? They yeah. Used to trim I mean, each they other. Like to... Didn't they track? I think I think the correlation between oil and gas, and and somebody who probably knows more than me and can probably correct me on this one. I just thought that it was because gas was associated with oil. Where you tended to find oil, you also tended to find gas. Yeah. So I thought those two were linked. Now it might be that one's a replacement fuel for the other, mm. which is something that we have seen in this market, where people who are able to burn heavy fuel oil for electricity generation have been doing so in preference to coal and gas because of the relative prices. Um, but you don't see so much of that in in, in Europe, of course. Yeah. But um, that's why that's why I'm thinking there, there used to be that tight correlation between the two. And there was there was some legacy contracts, I think, which have probably have all ended now, where it was indexed off the oil price. The actual price of gas was indexed off oil, so there was an element of the oil price in there. So if oil went up, gas had to go up with it. So, Dave, I, I like to put all my guests. You know, you've been amazing, actually. There's some of this stuff that you've been talking about, your knowledge regarding the, you know, how it all unraveled from from the start of the year. It's been really interesting to hear some. I always, I've been writing articles about this, but 
I think I've just written about the highlights of everything. You've actually gone into more detail, which really appreciate that for our listeners today. But um, I like to put my uh, guests on the spot. Um, and it's at this stage of the, the podcast where I, I'd like to ask you a question. And that question is, is there something you can give back to our audience today as a takeaway to help them in their roles as an energy expert? I think, you know, it, it's corny. It's, it's always the corny saying you've probably heard it a thousand times. But the cheapest kilowatt is the one you do not use. So I think in terms of what we're seeing in terms of high prices, whereas before we've looked at energy efficiency measures and the payback hasn't been there because the price relative energy prices have been low. Now's a good time to get in front of your FD and say, I've got this energy saving efficiency scheme and it now pays back not in five years. It'll pay back in two because of the high energy prices. Yeah. So some of those things that were put into cupboards never to be looked at again maybe should be brought out now, dusted off and, and, and put in place. That's a very good point, yeah. I think I'm going to go through my drawers later and get all those energy <laughs> reports I put together. <laughs> <laughs> and all those two-year contract, all those two-year paybacks, I've now come down to six months, maybe. Well, well, so, yeah, probably five minutes if you turn it off, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it does really, you know, for me, I, I, I've been wanting to say this all the way through, but I wouldn't know your crossover into the energy management side, but it is a big driver for energy management going forward. And I've written some documents to help organizations beat this crisis by just focusing on driving down the cost and, and switching off rather than running yeah. or, or lowering temperatures or increasing temperatures. It's a no yeah, brainer. Absolutely. Isn't it? Absolutely. And I, th I think this is, you know, it's it's key. Uh, a key thing that underpins all this, of course, is the data. And the more data you have, and the more you're able to see how individual pieces of equipment utilize energy. So you can look for the outliers where you've got an old pump that's not very efficient versus one of your new ones, and then look to build a case to have that replaced and thereby reduce your energy usage. I think there's a lot, you know, that I think the high prices have brought a number of things into sharp focus now. And, and, and it, it, you know, the documents you've written yourself, Paul, about energy efficiency and management of energy and being able to visualize energy and how you're using it is very key to this. Mm. Well, Dave, thank you very much for um, sharing your knowledge with us today. It's been great catching up. Um, I wish we'd been talking more regularly because I, obviously it does feel like this time last year that we caught up. Uh, for the first time, but it's been a, a real honor to, to catch up with you again. And thank you for the knowledge. And I'd like to just say, um, lastly, uh, please, you and your family stay safe um, during these times. Thank you very much, Paul. And, and you, thank you very much for hosting. It's been, it's been great. Thank you.